just the kind of thing. Well, is that thing less than <laughs> in any case, I think this is a, a browser. This is a browser. All right, great. <laughs> so, uh, like I said, I'm totally going to steal this. It's awesome. So, yeah, Faro concurrency control. I first had to figure out what currency control was. Uh, so that was the first step. Um, and it's uh, it's how it's, it, and we'll it go through that in the beginning. So, so from, from what I understood, this all started with how do, uh, uh, not how do uh, database researchers think about concurrency control, but how do app developers think about concurrency control, which is different than uh, than database people. And so the, their team picked out Ruby on Rails. If I don't know if you're familiar with Ruby on Rails. I used to be a Rails developer. Um, it's cool. Uh, it makes uh, uh, making web apps easy and comfortable, and a lot of people use it. It's uh, it's still relatively popular, even 10, 12 years on. Um, uh, and this is just proving, yeah, it's used. It's a thing. Um, yeah, all these places use it. Uh, some of them still use it. Um, uh, some of them don't. Uh, uh, one of the things uh, he wants to point out is that uh, Rails is a very uh, certain way of doing things. Uh, it's idiomatic. It's a. It's a. It's like, hey. This is how you do it. And DHH is a person. Um, <laughs> and he has very strong opinions. That's a nice way of putting it. Uh, and one of his very strong opinions is that he, don't, he doesn't think databases should do anything at all except store files. I'm sure he would have been happy if we stopped with Berkeley DB. And that was it. But uh, we didn't. Uh, so, guy hates databases, thinks databases suck. Uh, uh, so, he wants to have all of his database logic in the app. That makes sense. Uh, uh, and so, uh, there, there's this framework, it's been around forever. This is how it works. Uh, is he the dude who did the framework? He's the dude who no. did the framework. Okay. Yeah, DHH invented Rails uh, for 37 signals, bank, uh, base camp, um, is hugely popular now. He's, uh, he's a character. But uh, you know, a, uh, you know, his ideas have carried across the industry. Um, it turns out that uh, uh, this is, and we'll get to it later. But it's, this is not just Rails that thinks like this. It's just this is one example, and the example that the paper chose to use. Um, so, so we're baseline. We're going to pick Rails. That's what we're going to use, and. Uh, and here's uh, how it works. It starts out with a web server. Web server gets requests. Uh, and then there's a database in the back end. And there's a bunch of these workers, these Rails workers. So the web server uh, gets information, sends out to a Rails server. Rails server does application logic. Application logic says, OK, I'm going to do something to the database. So get it, put it, whatever you want. All right? That's how it works. Since there's many Rails servers, uh, they get processed at the same time. Uh, so the big question is, how does that work, right? And the web server is not part of Rails, so that's something like Nginx or... Yeah, exactly, right? Yeah. It's like Nginx. Or Nginx. Proxy or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, or, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. yeah I, think, I think Nginx is like the big one people use now. Do you know? Apache and Nginx. Apache, yeah. 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 Hey. Um, so, so here's a, a ton of different... Uh, Rails apps on the GitHubs that uh, uh, the team said, we're going to evaluate each one of these and dig through and see how they do concurrency control. Um, and so they found that out of these 67 projects with a million lines of code and a bunch of tables, that how many of them did transactions is not very many. So on Rails, you can do transactions. That's a thing. Like database transactions, there's, there's like this database there's a transaction block you can wrap uh, code in, and that will ensure that something's transactional. But that's not really a thing that Rails developers do on a day-to-day -day basis, right? It's like it's it's barely mentioned in the the documentation. So, no surprise, it's not used very much. Um, so, here's here's the ways you can do. You have transactions and. One of the things that's not mentioned here, but is mentioned in the paper, is locking. 
Uh, you can have uh, optimistic or pessimistic locking in Rails, but again, just like transactions, not very popular. The two big ones are validations, uh, and a validation looks like this. So like this, uh, this person class has two validations. It validates that, uh, that this name field, that colon name is a field in this person class, uh, it validates that it's present, that it exists, that you type something in for the name, and that's unique. Um, one of these is cool, although other one is not so cool that we'll get to later. Um, so like these are two validations um, that are at the app layer. And this is important to remember this is at the app layer, not at the database layer, right? So is this at insert or buried? It's before. Okay. It's before you insert it in, okay. right? Um, it's, it's at that layer above it. Um, yeah. We'll build a class that this object has a new name or we're creating this new object and then actual record will create this query really for you. Okay, so it, so it uses an ORM. It's an ORM. Yeah. Yeah, it's ORM. Yeah, yeah. Active record, do you see that active record base? That's that's the ORM for Rails. Okay. Yeah. And then the other thing is associations. And this is like something that is like interesting. Uh, the like one to one, one to me, all those relations uh, that you would think you would do at the database layer with uh, foreign keys, that's all handled at the app uh, layer as well. So the database and in the rail in idiomatic Rails world is ignorant of all you know, relationships. Yeah, yeah, that's the face. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's an accurate face. Uh, but like that's that's the idiom for for Rails. That's how it was laid out uh, as per DHH. So you have these validations and these associations that are that are also being enforced at the app layer, not the database layer. That that's 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 kind of the goal. The goal should be that the, in the Rails world, database is as simple as humanly possible, right? It could be files on a on a server. That's it. So when you look at the number of transactions uh, per project versus the number of these constraints, these uh, validations and uh, and associations, there's a bunch more. Five per table on average. There's a lot, right? So that's how people people use this, uh, and so he's like, "Why, why, why would you do this?" Um, and the reason is because that's how they tell you to do it. Uh, if you've never worked in Rails, if you've never been a web developer, this is uh, this is one of those web frameworks that people go from zero to doing stuff in. A lot of uh, code academies start you off with Rails. Like this is how a lot of people are learning how to program. Period. Right, and so it tells you straight up: use validations and associations. Don't don't think about database stuff. You don't have to worry about that. It's abstracted away, and we're going to deal with it in the app level. Um, and so that's why this exists. Uh, it's also why it's a, a good uh, uh, a good way to study this, right? Because it's it's isolated. Like to you, you have to really dig to even know that you can do transactions. It's almost not mentioned in the docs. I was surprised. I didn't know until I read this paper. I was like, you can do what? <laughs> uh, like, oh, I'll be done. Uh, so yeah, so basically it's validations and associations at the app level. So like I said, database doesn't know anything about this at all. It's, it's all dumb to the database. Uh, it's all in Rails and this is what the team calls feral concurrency control, which I think some people got angry about, but whatever. You know, it's just, uh, yeah. Tom's opinion might also be opinionated. Yeah, right. Shock, shock. <laughs> Opinions exist. Um, so yeah. So the presumption is that real developers prefer these uh, controls because that's what they're taught. That's, that's, that's what I was taught when I learned Rails. Um, uh, so the big question is, do they work? Um, so, you uh, validate concurrently. Like all of these three things, you're going to validate right there. Can you use transactions? Uh, because you can't use transactions because of weak isolation. What is weak isolation? Uh, is what Trevor asked. And so, I was thinking about it. I remember I was at Strange Loop a couple years ago, and Martin uh, Cutman had this presentation where he showed 
that that diagram that is super straightforward. No, it's not. Uh, uh, and these are all the different uh, isolation levels. Isolation is the I think the I in acid, uh, and uh, and there's like different levels of of how you can have an isolated uh, database, right? So I think at the top is a serializable uh, database, I think. And uh, if, if I understand this right, it's when, uh, if you're at a serializable level, uh, if you make a write on one node, all the other nodes uh, have communicated with you and they've all handshaked and they all agree and they're all cool and they're like, okay, we're good. And then, they, then you do the write. Um, uh, but that's expensive, right? So uh, over the years of database research, we've had all these different uh, levels of uh, not that, that gets looser and looser and looser and looser. Um, and this is where the crux of the problem comes is, uh, yeah? Can you share the paper at the, this page? Oh, yeah. It's a, oh, I, I think I did. No, let's double check. Let's make this. Uh, yeah, I draw. I, as I was like looking into this stuff, oh yeah, I just put it here. Boom. Okay. Good. Yeah. As as I was doing this, I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know how this thing. So uh, I would I put these out here. Um, but uh, so as you get farther down this tree, things get uh, looser and looser, and you start talking about you know uh, uh, more like NoSQL databases and eventual consistency and all these these things where you don't have the guarantees that you have with uh, uh, serializable databases, right? Where not everyone's agreed, maybe. You know. So that's important for a little bit later. Uh, um, so yeah, uh, it's insufficient to do a weak isolation. What, what were we saying? We can't use transactions in the database, or we, we can't implement transactions in, in the fair Rails. Rails. Uh, no, I think what they're saying here is that that it's uh, at the database level it's too weak because the default uh, so so Rails usually you know you you ship it with the database as Postgres or MySQL or or SQLite and the default isolation level for those databases if you're like vanilla setting it up. Is not serializability. It's like snapshot isolation, which isn't as as strong and doesn't give you the guarantees that you would want for the for all these validations to work perfectly. And he, and he that they point out in the paper that uh, there's a, a bug in oh, this is 2015 Postgres so that even their Postgres is serializable isn't really serializable because of some wonky bug. So uh, cool, uh, databases are hard. Um, uh, so yeah, I think what they're talking about here is the database layer. Yeah. So I thought they just wanted to abstract the I think you're right. Uh, they do. Uh, but I think what, what he's saying here is that uh, if, if transactions are, if, I don't know, it's a good question. Yeah. I guess maybe Seems like the philosophy is kind of like treat the database the same way you treat like a giant CSV file or something. Yeah. Like that. Uh, file systems have read write locks for simultaneous, or or perhaps treat it like a distributed hash table, <coughs> yeah. such that you don't actually have to run a SQL database. Yes. Which I don't know if Rails actually gets into, but that would be my motivation for getting. I can see that. Yeah. Getting away from dependent. Well, yeah, like like a lot of ORMs, like. The, one of the concepts is you should be able to switch out to the, the database, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Doing that with actual SQL is your, yeah. your real host. Yeah. That, that's, that's sad town, right? Yeah. You know? Does Rails still take advantage of the query optimizer and stuff at the database level? I don't know, actually. Yeah. Do you? Yeah. You can do explains. Oh, okay, cool. Okay. So it's still definitely taking advantage of the query, of yeah. the query optimization. Stuff. Yeah. I think a lot of this, well, this paper operates is just what comes out of the box and how these companies use it initially. And it explains why Twitter moves off of it and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. They ran into these problems, but uh, you can take advantage of the database and the migrations. Like the way to, the way that you can generate tables and add columns to them and 
update them. It does take advantage of constraints depending on what the scheme is. So we're talking about the validation for uniqueness constraint in this paper. Yeah. Uh, it, in my company, we actually use that constraint in Postgres. So oh, that's interesting. it's kind of happening at Rails and at the Postgres level. So I received errors at, from Rails and also from Postgres. So. Do, you, do, you, do you see the, the type of uh, uh, violations that, that they talk about in the paper? Um, not yet. Okay. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think I think there's an explanation of that because of the the ID space, right? Like they, later on, like in the in the appendix, they're like, oh, you know, if your ID space is like a million IDs, you're probably not going to run into this issue. And you're like, ah, ha, ha, you okay. know. So like, th there's some caveats to it. Um, uh, all right. So, all right, I'd look this up too. Like. The dude's like throwing in his his own research. He's like, by the way, this is a really cool thing you should check out. I look it up. It's like his paper from earlier that year. I'm like, you. Um, <laughs> so yeah, in, invariant uh, confluence. So basically, what uh, invariant confluence? And by the way, oh my god, uh, the morning paper is really good. Do you guys know the morning paper? Oh my god, this is this thing is great. This I don't know. How this person does this? This guy is uh, phenomenal. If you haven't checked out this website, um, he every day, with with the exception of three weeks a year, every <laughs> yeah, uh, like oh hard break. Uh, this guy like every single weekday posts a paper, a review of an academic paper. He's like he does like papers we do love daily. Dude's amazing. I don't, just you know that's uh, uh, so if you haven't checked out. Uh, the morning paper, totally worth checking out. Uh, it made grokking this paper and the, the papers that this paper referenced a lot easier, especially the invariant confluence test. I, I totally didn't understand that until I read his analysis of it. But we also, he also doesn't do one weekends. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what a slacker. Uh, <laughs> phenomenal guy. Um, uh, yeah. So I confluence invariant confluence means that uh, uh, if you have a validation and it happens on node A, and the same validation happens on node B, later on those two uh, and, and they they both commit to the database, and later on uh, you merge the two, you're not going to have a conflict, right? Something bad won't happen. That's uh, that's something that that means you're invariant confident. And he's going to go through an example here in a second that makes sense. So um, here's an example of the uniqueness uh, validation. I remember that that's when it said validates uh, validates name uh, uniquely equals true, right? So uh, we want to check at and, and what we care about is at this level. Like this is where the validations are happening, right? At this app level, is middle level. So at the middle level. We validate that the ID is unique, and if these are happening at the exact same time, uh, we check Stewie's like, okay, I'm ID one, and Anne is ID one. Since they're happening at the exact same time, they don't know about each other, and they go to merge, they go to commit, and the validation fails. So this is not uh, I confluent, right? This valid CRDT. What's that? It's not a CRDT. It's definitely not a CRDT. It's the definition of not a CRDT, right? Um, you cannot do this in isolation. You know, it's not safe without coordination, right? And this is specialized kind of race condition. Yeah, yeah, totally, right? You know, um, as, as I understand it at least. Uh, but yeah, so so because of this, this type it, and it's it's not the check, it's the the validation itself is inherently uh, not confident. You have to have agreement among the nodes to make it work. So the only way that this would work is if all the nodes could talk to all the other nodes at that exact time and have a handshake, have an agreement. You know, through I don't know, like Paxos. You know, you could uh, you could find an agreement, right? Like that. That's a thing that could happen. Um, or you have some other way of generating. Awesome. Also that. Uh, <laughs> Like on the Uber side, like that, whatever. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's the crux of it, right? You know, um, and again, this is like you know, 
analyzing how app developers, how we, I'm an app developer, do this today, right? Um, uh, and so here, here's another example. The other one, uh, this is user IDs are positive. Um, so uh, the user ID is greater than zero. Uh, that's something that every, you, I don't need to know uh, at, at this level, uh, I don't need to know any information about any other node for this to be verifiable, right? The, the same is true as, uh, is it present? So presence, uh, you, you typed in a name. That, that's, that's, I don't need to know anything about anything outside of my nodes on that. So uh, something's I confluent if you need to know, no other node needs to know any, any information. You don't need to know any information from any, any other node. You don't need to coordinate, right? So I confluent stuff is good. Good news, 86.9% of those uh, uh, validations, those app level validations and associations are I confluent. Hooray! But math tells us that 13.1% uh, are not sharp because math. Uh, so, so oh no, um, some of them are, you know, including like we just saw the uniqueness uh, one. This is kind of the one that they harp on uh, the most because it's uh, you know easy to understand or easier to understand, right? Well, it's also the primary key one, which is you know, right. Database. It's super useful, right? You know, you, yeah, that seems like an important thing, you know. Uh, so again, like uniqueness validation is broken. And what this graph shows is, uh, is that, okay, when, when you have just one Rails process, surprise, surprise, you have no duplicate records. But the moment you have more than one, uh, it, it goes up really fast. This, this is, I should note, in, in this, this is a totally fabricated data test. Like uh, this, is, this, is, this is them like crazy smashing it with, totally horribly unrealistic data and they ran it again with uh, like uh, Yahoo has this uh, this uh, set of more realistic data and it's better you know <laughs> and, uh, do you, still get duplicate you do still get duplicate records uh, one of the interesting things they found though with the realistic with the Yahoo is they call it the YCSB I don't know what that stands for Yahoo uh, cloud something benchmark super cool Safety. Oh, uh, I've heard of it. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I too. Enough. But you know, anyway, it's it's a, it's user data, right? Um, our, our fake user data. But one of the things they found in the gra one of the graphs he doesn't show in here is that when you have the number of keys gets extremely large, uh, you don't have the issue. So if you start out with a key space that's small. Uh, you're going to have tons of conflicts, but you have a key space that starts out really, really, really large, uh, then the conflicts are way less. And in fact, they found with, with a million keys for the, the Yahoo one, it just goes to bumpkiss, nothing. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, I guess that's my main reaction to this is, right? why, why don't you just pick a GUID? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, why not that, right? Yeah. Yeah. This, this is all at the Rails level. Right? Yeah. Like that, where this is all the Rails level, yeah. I mean, when, when I'm, like, if I'm using ID, like, one of the things I use in database a lot is like an auto increment, mm -hmm. an auto increment, or I like I don't assign the ID. I let the database or right. the, some other layer figure out the ID because I don't care. Yeah. Now and so you can imagine that 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 auto increment is happening on the app layer, and yeah. as we just showed, when the app layer is doing it, uh oh, that's you know. If you, the app layer is not being smart about picking key types. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. so right. Is, yeah, you could do that. So yeah. when they're doing this, are they hand giving it the things that are breaking? Yes. They are. Okay. Well, in in the, in that graph, they are. They're okay. they're deliberately breaking. So I'm saying. So I mean, that's also a case that I like, sometimes care about because sometimes I'll have situations where I'm like, you know, data entry, and I'll you know, two people are entering data, and they both enter the same data because yeah. everyone's always tired. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you know, so like, it, I think it's more of a case when you're when you have lots of automated entry, yeah. right? That that can get me in trouble because it, when there's two people entering at the same time, it's Really That's unlikely right. that right. it's gonna happen at the same time. Yeah. 
Yeah, they told they totally mentioned that the in the paper too about how you know you could use this to exploit it by uh, like a, a malicious attacker could like you know slam it with the with these ID by if you knew what the constraints were, mm -hmm. uh, like say your stuff was open source and I could just look at it on the interwebs, you know, like they did. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's definitely exploitable. Yeah. This, this is why you just use a generic UUID generator for ID is probably not gonna like clash. Even if a clash is like something like Yeah, but that's but you know it, it's totally not the default uh, pattern, right? Like, our we we, we never think of, of making our primary keys, you know, I do UUIDs. I do use our increment, but yeah. But like, how do they do auto increment if they're in parallel and they're not having any conversation? If Rails nodes have no conversation with other Rails nodes, how do they do auto increment? They they go to the database. They say what's the highest ID so far, and so and they, gets the you next get one. collisions, and you get ID collisions, and you break the database's promise. Right. The primary keys, the database fails. So, the database so still, if you're doing that, that's yeah. bad news. Is the database still being transactional under the hood? Because in that case, no. Depends. Nope. Depends. Depends on what you're setting up. Depends on those IDs and blocks. So each node yeah, is creating blocks. Yeah, that's right. All those blocks and all that. So it's never any collisions. And that, and then that's where the crux of the problem comes up here, because by default. Uh, MySQL or Postgres out of the box doesn't have that strong guarantee. You know, that yeah. doesn't have strong isolation. I think it's also worth noting too, it's not always just like the random ID that is grabbed here. It's not like some sort of thing about like that user handle or something. Oh, yeah. That's a unique constraint that I want to enforce that someone's been giving me and that could very easily. So I don't sign in and get someone else's user. Right. And so, like, yeah, like at Twitter, like, this one is just easy because <laughs> two people from out of the same Twitter handle and you also have. We're talking about exploiting something to gain access. That's a great way to gain access to someone else's data. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Boom, boom. Things. Uh, and it just goes to show that uh, associations fail too. This is interesting. Like the uh, the the one to many and one to one associations uh, have the same problem uh, as uniqueness. If I'm inserting. If I'm inserting the one-to-one -one associations on different nodes, yeah. and therefore it doesn't necessarily know that the other node already has the association. Right. Yeah. Or I add an association to you, while meanwhile you delete your side. Oh, okay. It would be like that. Well, because this, associations are all like foreign key constraints, right? Yeah. yeah. So you know, it, it goes to reason that it would be similar to uniqueness. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Right. Or, or if node A uh, adds, you know, X and, and node B adds Y to an existing collection. You see both X and Y when yeah. you're finished, That's or, right. or does one of them, or both of them get dropped? Did, yeah, yeah. Or did your did your one to one just become a one to two surprise? Yeah. You know. It's very common for load balancers to try and make sure that uh, all of them, the all the requests that are part of the same um, session end up going to the same node. Uh -huh. uh, I wonder if that's how like you know Rails developers work around this sometimes, right? Just rely on more sticky sessions. Sticky sessions, yeah. Well, that will help for your own data, but if it's shared yeah. data, yeah, yeah, uh, it's not going to help nearly as much because those location things were coming in from uh, multiple different sources. That makes sense. Yeah. We're we're two different people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fight. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was just thinking, like, at the end of the day, one will hit first. So if, if the database could guarantee some sort of failure, like it does with both commits, but if the database is itself split or it's not using transactions, you have no guarantee at any level. Yeah. If you just do overwrites and the first person just loses theirs, problem solved. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, your transactions aren't necessarily all going to be part of the same data. And so if you're going to get one transaction, you're going to get part of it. Like, you know, you're going to get one of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sad face. Um, so this is super interesting. Um, uh, so don't worry. They're not just hating on Rails. It's everything you use. Trust me, do you use it? You, use it, you probably use it. You know, spoiler alert, if you're an app developer, you 
you probably are. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> if you're an app developer, <laughs> then then this is probably a thing. Uh, I know we use the Hibernates, um, and you know, yeah, it, everyone does this. It's it's crazy town city. Um, Rails is just a, a great example because it's you know easy to approach. I was just thinking because I'm on Python, so Django uses their ORM is that a separate layer? The ARM is actually run a separate layer that's SQL Alchemy, and almost all the Python web frameworks use the same ARM. Really? Uh, SQL Alchemy is like the ARM. Oh, SQL Alchemy, yeah. Um, though it does allow for trans, it does do more on the database level. Uh, so that's interesting. Yeah. I, what and one of the main theses of this is is not that um, not that app developers are doing it wrong. It's that this is what app developers are doing. Um, and that we are, they in the database research community should grok what is happening in the real world and try to make it a little bit better for app developers, or really framework developers, to uh, you know take advantage of some of the really great database research that's happened over the last 40 years. Because um, we've, we've had tons of great advances uh, but it doesn't come, it, it doesn't translate for your day-to-day -day app developer um, because of... They're yeah. using an ORM that hates databases. Yeah, yeah, it's, Rails is definitely a, uh, uh, the, probably the most extreme example just because of how opinionated DHH is uh, <laughs> about uh, databases, right? So the, the, ta the, the big challenge from this uh, is how can we do right by app developers more or more early? Um, he's like, you should all research this because <laughs> money. Um, uh, and it, it's true. Um, so people don't like using transactions or relational models or XML, it turns out. Um, <laughs> Uh, oh yeah, he has a little coda at the end of this paper that that was really fun to read as not a researcher. This is like grand realization that open source is a thing. He's like, guys, 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 check it out. I, I've discovered this this grand creation, open source, and uh, uh, it's cool. Yeah, and he's like, you know, as researchers, we don't we don't uh, you know tap tap this and. He's like, you should, because it's cool. Um, uh, I don't know what this means. I tried to understand this. I didn't. Um, uh, I did, this is part of the pitch to uh, to use open source in research papers more. Um, uh, like publish your work in open source or just take advantage of all the open source world? Take advantage of the open source world in research papers. Get that PhD. Make it happen. Um, how we're doing things wrong. <laughs> well, no, no, no. Okay. See, that's, that's the misconception about it, right? Because it really is easy to look at this and say, hey, app developers are doing it all wrong. It's very tempting to say that. But I think the, the point of the paper is this is how, what app developers are doing. How can we help you know, the greater society get better at doing these things? Instead of researching out here, can we take a look at what's happening? So like, here's like, yeah, like computer science research and industry was like here, and then they diverged, and they're going off here, and they're like, oh wait, wait, they're over here. Let's, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's like figure out where they are and try to steer them in the right direction. Um, because, you know, we can, if, if we can figure out how to make framework developers or framework uh, writers take more advantage of more modern uh, 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 database research, then you can have more robust databases or more robust applications, right? And you won't have issues like this come up as much, I think. So was all this moot with like a home and add constraints to my databases and transactions to my queries? <laughs> Is that what we're hearing this? Well, no, I, I, I think you, you still have, I think if you, if you transactionatize all the things, that might help. Well, one of the things that, that wasn't in this presentation, but it was in the paper that was really interesting, was 
uh, they bring up uh, custom validations because you can write your own validators, yeah. um, and you can do that in uh, in I know you can do it in Hibernate as well, mm -hmm. and and they found that like you can you have problems like like they 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 can introduce a whole bunch of problems uh, because you know it's 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 wild west you can you can do whatever you want when you can write your own if, validations. If I write a, my daily uniqueness validator, it's like the old uniqueness validator, but doesn't check as much. Yeah. I have no. more problems. Right, because there, there's no, there's nothing in, in Rails or any of these other ORMs that are checking uh, iConfluence, right? You know, or invariant confluence. Well, it's, like, it's almost, it almost like, because like the one that I care about the most, usually when doing something, is like, okay, I care that it's a string, I care that it's an end, I care that it's below some certain. But so what I really good. care about is that it's unique yeah. with respect to the database. Like, that's a really important trait to me. So it's great that you get all this other stuff. Yeah. But like that uniqueness one is really important. It's super important. Yeah. It's it's you know out of the box you know unless your database is to be fully serializable, a problem. Right? Yeah. And so I actually looked at the SQL, and as far as I can tell, SQL is actually using the database to search. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it relies a lot on the databases, which is why I was actually open the transaction yeah. that was supposed to be in all of this stuff. So, so Django has, he has a, a little paragraph. I'll just read it because it's worth reading. Uh, so for Django, uh, it says, it backs uh, declared uniqueness of foreign key constraints with database level constraints, good. Yeah. Uh, and also can, supports custom validations, though. And the custom validations in Django are not wrapped in transactions. So uh, with Django, it's just the custom validations that are a problem. Whereas in Rails, it's baked in. No, the problems are baked in. Then it might, um, not, be, then it might not be the ORM layer that's the problem either. It might be right. Django's, because Django has... That makes sense, right? Yeah, Yeah, because, okay, so SQL Alchemy is not actually the form that Django uses. Django uses like a slight fork of the SQL Alchemy ORM with some extra stuff on top. So... <coughs> Because you have to be cool. Right? Anyway, this is really interesting. I thought it was a cool so picture. Trevor, most of what I've seen here is uh, complex with insertion. So what about appending the same record? Do you have that uh, off record or what? I guess if you had a, um, you mean like doing a put or something? Or, uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that two, two parties that have the same record. Who gets that first? And who has stale data? Right, yeah, right, because with Rails, you don't have locking. Yeah, well, yeah. you can lock, but, you know, by default, it doesn't, right? So who yeah, wins there? You can have optimistic locking in Rails, but what, one of the things they found in the paper is that almost no one uses it, again, because it's not, like, like front and center in the documentation. Yeah, like, what if somebody deletes a record and then this one? Yeah. Yeah, like what if someone deletes a record while at like the same time somebody else is trying to query the same record? Like there's a delete. Operator. I delete my Twitter account while someone else looks at my Twitter account. Yeah. How does that work? <laughs> Since you mentioned Twitter. <laughs> Because <laughs> <laughs> it's like, like the, uh, yeah, I think there is a, I mean, well, there is a check, like, to see okay. that the account is still active, right? Yeah. Is, yeah. But everything's eventually contingent, right? Twitter is mo mostly eventually contingent because I think what will happen in Manhattan, they do have these cases where things are just shut down consistently, they're used to run contingency in Manhattan, and all of them are. Oh, okay. Because a lot of cities are like that here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, part of this too is like, if I'm gonna go multi, if I'm gonna go start making little workers that, you know, do insertions, or if I shard my database, or if I cluster my database, God forbid, um, like I'm gonna hit problems with consistency. Like that's just part of the part of the game there. Mm -hmm. So I either need my eventual consistency. I need to say I don't care about consistency. Uh, I, I need like. I think part of it is like the, everything should be just super transactional and safe, and we need to do that. But like, no, I can't. Yeah, that's the thing, well, right? And they said like yeah. actually only like thirteen percent or whatever stuff actually needed those guarantees. Well, that's the other interesting thing, right? Yeah. yeah. 
even. And then we said, oh wait, but if also you have a large key space, you're also right. never going to hit this, which is like great, you know. And that's so where you start thinking. You know, to the thing to the extent that you can analyze and say, oh great, this is mm -hmm. a confluent. We can just go ahead. Yeah. Oh, here we need to do. So what I really need is a tool that I can like make my database model, and then I run this tool against my database model, and it will say how many like. Well, how many times did you get a duplicate key? Maybe you should change either your database models or change how you're doing your unique keys. Or something they can do stack like analysis on it. Right? <laughs> oh. Well, so there's actually a pop-up from 2016 about a tool called Sizey that annotates Java code with how big your list is. No, okay. what? That's great. Yeah, I mean, it's like open source, but like apparently like, it's just like academic open source. And, like, I think the oh. <laughs> Someone got their PhD. That's all that matters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Alexi, the dude who published it is brilliant, but it's not like an industry person's goal is not to transfer it. But it is really cool tech to see that something is there working and that it's pretty I don't know if there was anything along those lines of troubleshooting. When that validate. When when you're curious, just validate and then have the machine tell you that you're here's what you can do better. Yeah. Be be aware that this is what you're gonna deal with. I'd be, it'd be neat to, to see that where you'd be like, oh, I run this. Like, okay, these these things are going to be problematic. And you, you can just know. Um, if, if you can strain what you do to just CRDTs, this would, would this alleviate <laughs> some of the issues, right? Uh, yeah, it would take care of it. Yeah. You, you would be, stuck you'd be using a, like radically <laughs> limited in what you can do. Yeah. But, but then you like don't need any added, coordination. Like you couldn't do tables. Multiple tables. This is my one big table. Look at that. Good enough for Google, right? <laughs> oh. oh man. So isn't Peter Bayless uh, little finger on Game of Thrones? He has a little finger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but is it Peter? He looks like a guy. Have you guys seen a picture of this guy? This is a handsome researcher. No. It's like objectively handsome. Um, that was also interesting at the end, though, when you mentioned that like relational databases are like not popular because I've heard they're like coming back in fashion. Coming like, back. Really? Look at that guy. I don't know, that's what I've heard. But it's all hair say, so who knows? So I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, place my bet now that uh, uh, he's going to get a Turing award in about twenty years. We won the um, the PhD. This is PhD award. There's like a Jim Gray PhD. It's like he won like basically. <laughs> In your face, Alvaro! Oh, so sad. Um, <laughs> oh, there you go. What's he doing now? Sounds cool. So that, that, I mean, the uh, one of the other things about this paper where yeah. you talked about at the end was how all this is like open source and exists. Researchers, you should use it. But it's really <laughs> weird to me because there are certain areas of research that's just the thing to do. Like if any of you've seen uh, static code analysis, you know, they're right. always going to be a bunch of lines. Uh, oh, it's super yeah. interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, mean, uh, I was going to say, there are certain, like, Fields of research that just only go about like the open source community too. Like any of the research, like a lot of operating system research, also is pretty open source because. Because thanks, yeah. I, I wonder if this is. is unique to to like the Sigma audience and the uh, like the database world. Uh, it's like, hey, like we never do this because it has never been a thing before. Um, that's great to see. You know, well, you get a lot of industry stuff in there too. I think just the database stuff that we studied with IBM that much of stuff. Did someone's PhD actually invent this technique IBM patented 15 years ago? <laughs> I uh, accidentally reinvent this patent. Uh, I mean, I would really suspect it leads to databases that you can run into issues with, like, you know, if you care about scalability, it's like, are there people that are going to make, like, a multi hundred gig or, like, terabyte database available for free? Huh. I don't know. Sure, if you have enough, if you can uh, scale vertically well enough. <laughs> <laughs> and you have the hard 
course there is. It's a song. Oh. A lot of the yeah, a lot of the uh, the, ast the astrophysics is a uh, apparently is interesting open source because I keep hearing talks by Jake Vanderpax, who's super awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's an astrophysics researcher at um, UW who does a lot of uh, Pi data stuff. Um, he does a lot of Python data analysis stuff. Jake Vanderpax. He does a lot of stuff. Do you understand visualization? Did do a paper to do I actually never read right his there. papers. There is. I've only seen his talks on visualizations, but he does good talks on visualizations. Nice. Supernovae. Yeah, That's he's, cool. He's probably at the yeah. mm. or oh. the database. He's pretty. Pre he's pretty like present in like local stuff. Yeah. Cool. So, so also database. I wonder if the weather data, like NOAA and all that, too. So oh yeah, NOAA so is all actually, public. Like, yeah, there's like on Bob's so someone actually did like their little hand hack weather data visualization of like the wind currents, and they were using it in their database. So the NOAA actually publishes like every day like the whole days of track wind and stuff. Like that. That's awesome. I can imagine. I can imagine like if you were to take spatial like spatial Well, I, the sports day is really interesting too because there's like a ton of baseball data that's yep. out there. It's free and you can get to get it. Um, yeah. Well, they only have like a hundred years. Yeah. Yeah. A bit. And they're they're a bunch of stats nerds. Yeah. Nate Silver. They definitely Nate Silver. Yep. Starters of baseball. Oh, I know that's how it started. Yeah. Are you getting recorded? Is this going to be this long trailing? <laughs> that's so I, I'm I'm fine with that. Um, what well, uh, papers we love? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's that's how it works. Uh, Scott mentioned lobsters. If all y'all don't know lobsters, like lobsters is great. It's like Hacker News plus plus. It, I really like it. I really like lobsters. More focus on links, less on comic. So, so yeah. it's like it's like Hacker News, but they took all the good ideas that other other like similar Hacker News things have, and then just kind of would cobble them together in a way that sort of works. Just like Reddit well, for Hacker News. It's like Reddit for Hacker News. That's meta. Uh, <laughs> way less meta. Then, then uh, there's no meta on uh, on lobsters. <laughs> Maybe a little bit, but not yeah, uh, what, what does it take away from this paper? Do not use Ruby. Do not use Rails. No, do not use no, no, no. CH, Do not use videos, Postgres. Do not use Oracle. Or do not trust anybody who suggests a native framework. <laughs> Burn your computer. Burn your computer. <laughs> <laughs> be, be, be aware of the go risk. into farming, right? <laughs> be aware of the risk you are taking when you go use uh, an ORM because, mm -hmm. or anything. Be aware of the duplication. Be aware of the risk you're taking. And just well, well, it seems like his main point was, hey, database research was the research that's it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's the real point. The real point, like this was a paper pitched to database researchers. Not to me as an app developer, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, like, I agree. I think his main point was like, "Hey, people aren't doing what you're look, what you're researching. People are doing something else. Why don't we spend some? There, there's probably good research money that industry will pay for if you do the stuff that they care about." You know. Did this um, precede his CRGT paper of conversion replicated data types? It was a different paper. It was Shapiro. Oh, I'm trying to add that. Yeah, he's doing that too. But he had, um, he's telling his, um, he's like hat and ram transactions, okay. which are also like more just like high available transactions. Okay. Yeah. I think this is like a, so like another thing in academia they do is they have like motivation papers because they have to like motivate the people to do a problem to like get published. And so this is really like motivating to do your work, right? And yeah. then like also providing the technology to motivate you to do your work. So you'll see these motivation papers in the public. There's a bunch of like bug track and, and things like that. People just go look and do a survey of like what's going on in open source, what's going on in the industry. Because then if that gets published, then you can like publish a paper that's presented to the industry that because then you can cite says a problem and then you cite that paper and like this is a problem. <laughs> like, oh, so nice. There's a lot of like this weird like also like some of the publishing game going on here. Oh, that's it's, like, it's like you're like I want to do this feature and they're like no and then the bug is filed. Yeah, I want to do this yeah, feature yeah. work and they're like yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. This was prep work for his PhD students. Yeah, right. Yeah. Someone got a masters from this one, guaranteed. Yeah. I mean, someone got something from this paper. Oh yeah. Eventually. It's a fun paper to read. Is is. It was delightfully approachable. The real lesson here is just start doing data mining on GitHub until you find something and then publish a paper on it. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> there, there's a great game where somebody did that, and I think they focused on the top in open source projects and did stack analysis to find all the to do to fix this or <laughs> this should never happen or all the latent bugs around that are handling copy paste of the final in a switch. Yeah. And it, was, it was fascinating. And it was this is how buggy OpenSSL is, and this is how buggy Nginx is. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. OpenSSL is well, no, it couldn't be. That doesn't sound right. <laughs> Makes my heart beat. Oh, Where the equals one person. Well, BSD, yeah. well, BSD said, no, we're going to do our own. They did their own cryptography, and that has its own set of problems because they forked it. They have, I mean, in some ways, they have less contributors. So, so there's its own set of problems in your own fork, forking your own thing. The problem is also that open cell is so general that a lot of their bugs actually, you know, a decent amount of their bugs are through some of the, the like offshoots. And oh, the, interesting. And the interactions between, like, so if you if you have like a really small problem, you know, I just need a little bit of something, like it might be better to do that thing. Yeah. But also, open cell is probably good at it because that's also rough tested. If it's a well tested. Yeah, and, and at least with open cell, if you get hosed, so is. It's not your fault. Yeah. That's yeah. the thing, right? Yeah. There's a little bit of CYA going on there. It is your fault if you start using the primitives in there without knowing what you're doing. Yes. Because that's their main problem. It's like all the choices and plan. It's like, oh, just pick these, it'll be fine. It's like if you start sticking stuff together manually, then it is your fault. Mm. Yeah. No, no, that sounds like a great cyber scheme. Oh. <laughs> what could possibly Maybe, go yeah. on? <laughs> well, yeah. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.